defining the future of conferences and events, we check out the new hybrid format at Singapore Expo. Taking a COVID-19 test could soon be as easy as breathing into a tube and knowing the results in less than a minute. And anything's possible. Burgers, meatballs, satay. You can now buy impossible meat directly from supermarkets. Hello, you're watching The Big Story coming to you live from The Straits Times Newsroom. I'm Hari Antodiman. And I'm Olivia Quay. You can subscribe to The Straits Times channel so you never miss a single episode. Diagnosing a patient with COVID-19 could soon be as easy as getting the person to breathe into a tube and getting the results in under a minute. That's right. Well, take a look. This is our colleague, science correspondent Audrey Tan, taking the breathalyzer test. Developed by a spin-off company from the National University of Singapore, it's still at a prototype stage. Mm, but it has so far achieved an accuracy rate of more than 90% during a pilot clinical trial involving 180 patients at the National Centre for Infectious Diseases. Researchers will continue to fine-tune the algorithm using data collected from the next phases of the trial. Well, the breathalyzer test looks pretty straightforward and Audrey certainly looks uh, far less anxious than me when I had a COVID-19 swab test a few weeks ago. I remember that and you narrated the experience to me as well. I narrated you? Yes, you did. <laughs> now let's bring in Audrey so she can uh, share more about the breathalyzer test. Uh, Audrey, hello. Explain the steps to us, Audrey. As Olivia said, it looked straightforward and painless. Yeah. Hi guys, yes, it's super straightforward and, and painless, as you said. Uh, all you need to do is, uh, first you use a disposable mouthpiece and then you attach it to this machine, which is a high-precision breath sampler. And your exhaled breath is collected and fed into a machine known as the mass spectrometer. And uh, there will be some machine learning and an algorithm inside that processes the data and gives you the reading in less than a minute. So right now, the reading is the entire process of reading it is not yet uh, automated, but researchers are working on it, so you can get the reading, as in you can interpret the readings really easily. I see. Well, Audrey, this test registers uh, chemical changes in a patient's breath, but how can that diagnose COVID-19 compared to, you know, the more established COVID-19 tests like the PCR and rapid antigen tests? Okay, sure. So maybe before I go into how this breathalyzer test uh, detects COVID-19, I can just give a brief overview about the other two tests that you mentioned and how they differ. So mm -hmm. for PCR tests, they, uh, the polymerase chain reaction test actually picks up viral genetic material in a patient sample. So that's why the nasal, nasal pharyngeal swaps are needed. Uh, it detects the viral genetic material or RNA. For rapid antigen tests, they pick up viral proteins. So the virus manufactures these proteins based on what their genetic material tells them. So for this particular breathalyzer test, it's slightly different because it registers, um, it detects these things called volatile organic compounds in human breath. And these are particles that we all breathe out every day um, because of biochemical reactions in our human cells. So, but the thing is the VOC signature from a healthy person breath would be different from a person with a sickness. And depending on your disease or illness that you have, each signature is different. Like you produce different amounts or quantities or even types of VOCs depending on what illness you have. So based mm. on this knowledge, the researchers tailored this algorithm to be able to pick up COVID-19 patients uh, and based on the unique breath signature that patients would have when they have um, mm. this respiratory disease. Right. So Andre, this breathalyzer test uh, is still undergoing trials. If it's proven successful, will it completely replace the swab tests? Uh, I think right now this is highly unlikely. Uh, the PCR test is still considered the gold standard test um, because this would be the, the test to help avoid uh, the false negatives. So you don't want to miss out diagnosing a patient because that could lead new outbreaks. So um, based on what NCID, the National Centre for Infectious Diseases told me, they said that this breathalyzer test could potentially be used as a screening tool Although to confirm a COVID-19 diagnosis, they would still need to go for PCR tests. But uh, I think the authorities and the scientists and clinicians here are still actively looking and analyzing all these rapid tests to see how they could supplement uh, PCR testing at the national scale. 
Mm. Well, I appreciate the time, uh, Audrey, for speaking with us and thank you for coming on to the show. We've been speaking to our colleague, science correspondent, Audrey Tan. Now, you can read more on this breathalyzer test over at straightstimes.com. An update on the COVID-19 situation here. Six new cases were confirmed today. They included two from the foreign worker dormitories and four imported cases. There were no new community cases in today's count. More details will be released tonight. Also in the local headlines, from November 9th, Singapore Airlines will start three weekly non-stop flights to New York's JFK International Airport. This new route will be the 38th destination that SIA is operating flights to in the current climate. The flights will transport both passengers and cargo. Now, SIA said the service will be supported by the growing number of transfer passengers who can now transit via Changi Airport. The Attorney General's Chambers said today that the case of a 28-year-old man who was allegedly involved in the Orchard Towers fatal brawl in July last year will be tried in the High Court. Tan Sin Yang, who faces a murder charge, is accused of causing the death of Mr. Satish Noel Gobidas. Seven people, including Tan, were involved in the incident and initially charged with murder. But following investigations, the AGC found that the other six individuals were not involved in causing Mr. Satish's death. The charges against them were then reduced. From this week, you'll be able to buy the plant-based meat substitute Impossible from 79 fair price supermarkets as well as online grocer Redmart. A 340-gram pack will sell for $16.90 or about $5 for 100 grams, more expensive than a lot of supermarket ground beef. Still, Impossible is banking on curious home cooks snapping up the product. Meanwhile, in the midst of the ongoing pandemic, many events find themselves on hold or having to make big changes to adapt. Trade shows are among the many affected. Well, what would a large-scale business event with guests from all over the world look like in a time of safe distancing and restricted travel? Multimedia journalist Kimberly Zhao finds out. After several months of serving as a community isolation facility, the Singapore Expo opened its doors today for its first MICE event the Industrial Transformation Asia-Pacific 2020. I'm at the Singapore Expo Max Atria waiting to enter the venue, but before that, attendees need to save entry, have their temperatures taken, as well as download the Trace Together app. These are all usual practices in these COVID-19 times. MICE events have also had to pivot to a hybrid format with physical and virtual attendees. ITAP mixes digital elements like live chats and 3D rendering with traditional physical elements to provide experiences for all participants. This includes entering rooms in separate cohorts, as well as watching dialogue sessions where some of the members on the panel are chiming in via video conferencing. We make sure that uh, social distancing are enforced here. Air that we breathe in now, the air con con condition systems are all filtered through. It is a high-grade high, high grade, uh, filtration system that we put in place. The escalators are all properly uh, sanitized. It is very unlike any shopping mall that I go to. We want to make sure that we give the confidence to all participants and all organisers that Singapore Expo is indeed a very safe environment, a very safe property for all uh, participants to come back again and do business. No stone left unturned. Even the serving of food has safe management measures in place. Since buffets aren't the safest way to enjoy food in the middle of this pandemic, the event has gone for an a la carte food serving style, but with a twist. You scan a QR code to see the description of the items, and the food is brought right to you. Socially distanced, of course. Since October 1st, event organisers have been able to apply to pilot MICE events with up to 250 attendees. And even though it can host more than 200 guests, ITAP's online opening ceremony today saw 100 attending physically. However, they were joined remotely by 5,000 online audience members from all over the world. Kim Lee Jiao for The Straits Times. 
Thanks, Kimberly. Now, our colleague journalist Suen Tan was at the Singapore Expo as well. Suen, MAIS events have to be organised in a hybrid format. Uh, so, what did you observe today in terms of number of physical attendees, uh, safe distancing measures and so on? So, this morning's event was actually the opening ceremony for the whole ITAP and it consisted of a small studio audience, including the media. And altogether, there were about, let's say, 100 attendees. The mm. event was also live streamed to other participants online. So there were maybe, let's say, 5,000 people who signed up for the whole event. The chairs were placed about one meter apart from each other. And the attendees were assigned into zones of 50 people at maximum. And each zone was then further separated into groups of 10 or 20. And people can only mingle and interact with those who are like in the same group as them. So each group also has staggered timings for arrival and departure and their own designated entrances. So this means that when we entered the venue, there were actually very, very few other people who were there and there was very little mixing and mingling. And these are in accordance to the safe distancing measures. And the venue also had many barriers to guide attendees and ensure that the guests were in the different groups were separated. And even during dining, each group only had a maximum of five people. And instead mm. of the usual mm. buffet tables, the meals were individually packed and they were provided um, with boxes as well to store our masks in while eating. And we had to put our masks back on when the meal was finished. Right. Well, um, so when you spoke to SingX, which uh, organised ITAP, so what are some of the challenges that they faced in, you know, in putting together this uh, conference? So this is actually the first event at the Singapore Expo since it was used as a community care facility. And SingX did a lot of work to ensure that it could safely host people again. And besides frequently sanitizing facilities like the escalators, the air conditioning also has a high-grade filtration system to ensure that everyone gets fresh air in the venue. Another challenge was to ensure that the online participants still get a good experience. So today's event was not in a usual convention hall, but it was in a studio production space so that the lighting and the sound quality could be good enough to broadcast to the online audience. And even though many activities are online, but there are physical boat on activities in different locations in Singapore. So this ensures that some small groups of participants can go on actual small engagement tours in these locations, such as Singapore Polytechnic with their advanced manufacturing center. And each location can host about 30 participants. And these activities are also continually streamed online for the virtual participants. Hmm. Well, good to know. Thanks so much for joining us today, Suen. That was journalist Suen Tan. During a dialogue at the ITAP conference, Deputy Prime Minister and Finance Minister Heng Swee Keat said Singapore has taken pains to diversify its economy by investing in various sectors so that the country has many engines of growth. We have, a, have traditionally maintained a strong manufacturing base and manufacturing now accounts for slightly over 20% of our GDP. And we intend to keep a well-diversified economy we have uh, undertaken a, to grow a well-diversified economy because we believe that you need many engines of growth and that allows us to be better diversified, to be more resilient and also to build on the linkages across industry clusters. Let's take a look at what's making global headlines. A World Health Organization expert has said Europe and North America should follow the example of Asian countries by persevering with anti-COVID measures even when case numbers are low. People in Asia, communities in Asia, uh, do have higher levels of trust and compliance in government and they've tended to be able to implement uh, for longer some of the measures that have been required of them in terms of their own behaviour. Many of these countries had serious follow through. That finish line was false. Rapid one hour coronavirus tests will be conducted at Heathrow Airport from today to allow departing travellers to enter countries where a negative COVID 19 test result is needed to skip quarantine. According to the Times newspaper, this falls under the UK's plans to open up international travel. Passengers are required to book a test in advance at a cost of £80 or 140 Singapore dollars. Testing will first begin for travellers going to Hong Kong and Italy.
Well, closer to home, in a joint statement today, leaders from Malaysia's ruling parties, AMNO and PAS, said both parties pledged to strengthen their cooperation in preparation for the next general election. AMNO and PAS will register their alliance under the name Muafakat Nasional. The statement, however, did not mention Prime Minister Muhyiddin Yassin's Bersatu party. According to local media, Thai Prime Minister Prayut chan chas cabinet has agreed to hold a special session of parliament next week amid escalating protests. Nation media said the session would be held next Monday and Tuesday without giving further details. Mr Prayut had previously said he supported such a session after more than three months of protests against him that have also called for monarchical reforms. The second and final U.S. presidential debate will feature a mute button to prevent a repeat of what happened in the first debate. The new rule means both President Donald Trump and Joe Biden will have two minutes of uninterrupted time at the start of each segment before the microphones are turned back off turned back on. If you recall, the first presidential debate plunged into chaos with Mr. Trump repeatedly interrupting Mr. Biden. Meanwhile, Mr. Trump, who's lagging in the polls, has launched a 55 million US dollar advertising blitz two weeks before election day. And those are our top stories for today. For more news and videos, visit straightstimes.com and remember to subscribe to our YouTube channel by hitting the red button below. I'm Olivia Kuei with Harian Sudiman. Thanks so much for joining us on The Big Story.